which is called The Valkyrie's Grave. All I have are her bones. I don't know her name or precisely where or when she was born. I don't know how she died, though bones often do betray such secrets. All I have are her bones, now boxed and stored in a museum in Sweden, bones gathered by an archeologist in 1878 from a grave beside a hill fort overlooking the Viking town of Birka, where she was buried in the mid 10th century in a spacious wood-lined pit. To tell her story, all I have are her bones and what was unearthed with her. An ax blade, two spearheads, a two-edged sword, a clutch of arrows, their shafts embellished with silver thread, a long sax knife in a bronze ringed sheath, iron bosses for two round shields, a short bladed knife, a whetstone, a set of game pieces bundled in her lap, a large bronze bowl, much repaired, a comb, a snip of a silver coin, three traders' weights, two stirrups, two bridles bits, and spikes to ride a horse on the ice, along with the bones of two horses, a stallion and a mare. Of her clothing, all that remains are an iron cloak pin, a filigreed silver cone, four baubles or buttons of coiled silver wire, strips of silk embroidered with silver, and a scattering of mirrored sequins. Until 2017, when DNA tests proved the bones were female, this grave, numbered BJ581, was held up as the classic Viking warrior's grave. Quote, the position of the skeleton, wrote a Swedish archeologist in 1966, gave the impression that he had been sitting in the grave rather than laid out. The equipment indicates that this is a warrior's grave rather than that of a merchant. The date of a silver coin found underneath the skeleton of the dead man provides a fairly good idea of the date of the grave, 913 to 980 AD. The implications of the dead man turning into a dead woman dazzle me. They ignite my imagination. A burial with weapons and horses, an archeologist claimed as late as 2008, used, quote, a widely recognized symbolic language of lordship, one that was unquestionably masculine. To assume all such weapons graves are male now seems to me to be a mistake, one that has skewed our image of the Viking Age. How does history change if we turn that assumption on its head? There are other ways to interpret the grave other ways to explain a female body buried with weapons. But the simplest seems to me the most likely. Defending their findings in 2019, the team that tested her DNA said, BJ581, quote, suggests to us that at least one Viking Age woman adopted a professional warrior lifestyle. They added, we would be very surprised if she was alone in the Viking world. So that's from the introduction. And you named her Hervor, or? Yes, I named her. Um, I thought I was justified because other skeletons have been given names like Lucy the Australopithecus mm -hmm. and Ötzi the Iceman. Um, the researchers themselves did not give BJ581 a name, but in order to tell her story in the way I did, I felt I needed to name her. You know, this isn't your first book about Vikings. It's your sixth book about Vikings. Yeah. This is really different than what you've done before. Um, how did you start that? What, what inspired you? What, what got you to here? Well, as, as you said, I've, I've been writing about Vikings a long time and I've also written another book about the status of, of women in the Viking age. So I thought I knew about women in the Viking Age. Um, I had to do a lot of relearning, it turns out. But what really 
uh, was the spark behind this book uh, was a chapter in my previous book, Ivory Vikings. And that book is uh, uses sagas, but it also has a lot about the history of chess in it. Um, what I was talking about in that book is the uh, Lewis Chessman, and I have one here right on my desk that I, I keep nearby. Uh, these beautiful little ivory um, chess pieces were carved in around 1200. And the thesis that I was following in Ivory Vikings was that they were carved in Iceland by a woman named Margaret. And Margaret lived at the time that the Icelandic sagas were being written. So one of the questions that I wanted to answer that I'm not really sure I, I came up with an answer was why are there women on the chessboard? Why did the chess queen catch on? And we know this happened in 10th century Europe, even though uh, the Lewis Chessmen is one of the first actual sets we have with a queen. Uh, we, we have uh, rules on how to play chess from the 900s, the late 900s that say there was a, a queen on the chessboard. And in Arabic chess, that piece is a male, it's a vizier. So somehow when the game came into Europe in the 10th century, people accepted the idea that there would be a woman in a battle game. I mean, chess is war. It's a game of war. So what were women doing on the battlefield in 10th century Europe? Well, Margaret, being an Icelander, would have known stories of the Scandinavian queen, the queen of Norway, Gunhild, mother of kings. Uh, she would have known stories of the Valkyries and the shield maids from poetry and sagas. You know, maybe that's, you know, how this chess queen was accepted based on these stories of women warriors. But then the part that I couldn't really get into in Ivory Vikings was, well, wait a minute. We know that Gunhild, mother of kings, was a real person. Maybe the other women warriors are too. So how does archaeology fit in? What can archaeology tell me? Uh, how do archaeologists decide when they find a grave with weapons in it? Um, mm -hmm that this warrior was male or female. So I was looking around for an archeologist who was studying a grave that I could follow around for a while and maybe you know, learn the techniques that are coming into archeology span on how you know, bones are examined. You know, I thought this was gonna be really scientific. Well, I arranged to meet uh, Neil Price, who is the head of the Viking Phenomenon Project at the University of Uppsala. And he was coming to a conference in the US in, in Orlando in January, 2016. And so I went to the conference and I you know, arranged to meet Neil. And I said, you know, I've got this vague idea that I wanna write a book about Valkyries and woman warriors. And, and can you recommend a grave that I could study? And I'd really like it to be, you know, the grave of a woman who is a warrior or who has weapons. And I'd really like the archaeologist in charge to be a woman. And he's looking at me and his eyes are getting bigger and bigger. And he's like, got this really shocked expression on his face. And he says, how do you know about that? He says, I can't talk about that yet. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I hit something here. And he said, if you can put off your book for like a year, there's going to be a study coming out that's going to change the conversation. So I you know, was waiting for this to happen. And in September, 2017, when they published a female Viking warrior confirmed by genomics, uh, Neil Price was one of the people on the team, but the lead researcher was Charlotte Hedenstierna Jonsson um, from the uh, Swedish History Museum. And so she was the woman that uh, really led this re-identification of the Birka warrior. So that was the grave and that was the archeologist and that was the, the science that I decided to, to uh, base um, this, this Valkyrie book on. So you had a, a hint that it was coming. I had a hint, but he didn't really, I mean, he actually gave me a bigger hint than I followed up on because Charlotta was also at the conference and he gave me a list of names of people at the conference who I should go talk to. And I looked at what papers they were presenting and I didn't make the connection. 
So I didn't actually meet her at the conference. <laughs> it's like, okay, I should have been a little bit more rigorous here, but I then had to fly to Sweden to talk to her. Well, and that was, could, at least I had time to do that before COVID hit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you could not have expected. No. Um, but the other thing I didn't expect was that not everybody believed they had gotten the science right in September, 2017. I mean, there was this huge backlash in archaeology, in Viking studies, uh, saying that, oh, you must have made a mistake because we know Viking warriors were all men. So this, this you know, DNA result that you got can't possibly be true. And you know, that just completely dumbfounded me. And so when, you know, as, as I've said you know, before, I really thought I was going to be like writing about bones. And it turned into a book about bias. So were the people who were backlashing, um, were they archaeologists? Were they historians? Were they, they both? Were both? They were both. And they were people who, some of them are very well known you know, in the field of people whose work I respect and, and have used before. And mm -hmm. it, was, it was really quite shocking. And it was also shocking for the researchers in Sweden who hadn't expected this at all. You know, they thought, look, we did our job. We did our job right. We, we checked everything. Mm -hmm. This is a woman. So now we have to, you know, deal with, you know, how do you interpret that? Um, well, and they came back then in 2019, right, with a follow-up yes. study to say, they yes, yes, we did it right. Oh, and I was so, so anxious when that study came out because <laughs> I had, I had talked to them and they said, yeah, well, we're going to go into all these questions and we're going to you know, bring out this, this new study, but I kept thinking, what if they back away from their conclusions? I mean, I already had pretty much the rough draft of the book finished you right. know, by the time their 2019 paper came out. And I'm like, oh, please don't back off. Of please don't back off, yeah. But they didn't, they didn't back off one step. They right. said, you know, we now have to deal with how do you interpret these graves? Because if, if this was a warrior, when it was a male skeleton, it's still a warrior. When it's a female skeleton, you can't reinterpret the symbolism of a grave just because you've discovered that the sex of the skeleton has right. changed. So uh, it's, yeah. it's gotten very interesting. Yeah, and it does seem like in the years since then, we're seeing more and more examples of skeletons that are being identified as we are, and, and one of the reasons is that uh, DNA testing is becoming more common, it's becoming easier, it's becoming cheaper, and every time you get, um, you know, a kind of you know, earth-shattering or conversation-changing result like this, then it's easier to get the grant money to do the next one. Um, it yeah, changes the DNA. question. Yeah, yeah, ancient DNA is really hard to work with, but the scientists are getting very good at it now, and they can tell you, no, we didn't make a mistake. We know what we're doing here. So that's you know that's why we're seeing more results because there's they're doing more testing. Great. You know, one of the things that impresses me so much about what you've done on this book is, in fact, the way you've worked with the science. Mm because you've worked with scientific materials that a lot of us, a lot of historians are not really qualified to work with. So you're doing both sagas and science. And could you talk a little bit about your research process and how those two things work together? Sure. Um, I have an advantage that I'm not a historian. Um, I worked as a science writer at Penn State University for 20 years. And so I wrote about science in every field and I got very comfortable reading scientific papers and interviewing scientists. That's, that was not a problem. But I had a parallel life the whole time that I was working as a science writer because I got my master's degree in comparative literature studying medieval literature mm -hmm. at the same time as I started working as a science writer. And then I, fell in love with the Icelandic sagas and started going to Iceland as often as I could. And so I had these two things going simultaneously, science and sagas. Um, I was able to bring them together in uh, The Far Traveler mm -hmm. in um, 2007 that came out. So that was the first time I was able to use archeology span and Icelandic sagas to talk about the status of, of Viking women. And so 
in most of the books that I've done since, I have combined the science and the saga. Um, you know, in the Abacus and the Cross, the book that you you discovered, it was more medieval mathematics than science rather than archaeology. But um, I was able to use archaeology in, in Song of the Vikings and also in Ivory Vikings. So I I kind of know what I'm doing with you know the archaeology and and the way I used it for this um, this book was that it it provided me you know, this, this grave, BJ581, and all of the archeological studies they have done of it and of the town of Birka where, where this grave was located, they provided me with the chronology um, of this woman's life and also with the geography of where she may have lived and where she may have traveled. So for instance, in the introduction, I mentioned that there was a little bit of a coin found in the grave and that coin can be dated. Coins are wonderful for archeology span because they can usually be dated. This one, unfortunately, has a, a big range. It's, it's anywhere between 913 and 980. So we know we're in the 900s, but the archeologists who studied the grave um, can tell that when this woman was buried, the warrior's hall that was part of the fortress um, up at Birka where the warriors lived, that had still been standing when this grave was, was um, when this person was buried. So that burned down around 965. So that gave me a date of probably she was buried before 965. Then there was the studies of her bones and her teeth, which was part of the DNA study. Um, we can find out that she was between 30 and 40 years old. So that gives me a start date. So around 930. So now my chronology is 930 to 965. Uh, we also find out some really intriguing facts about her from her bones and her teeth. For instance, she ate well all her life. She never had a period of starvation or malnutrition, which in the Viking age means she was probably from a rich family. She could have even been royal. She was also very, very tall for a woman. She was five foot seven. And the average man of her time was only five foot five. And there's a king of Denmark who was alive during her lifetime, Gorm the Old. And he was considered very tall at five foot eight. So she's you know, quite a lot bigger than most people around her. Her teeth can also tell us that she was not a native of Birka where she was buried. She came from away. Um, the isotopes um, of strontium mimic calcium when your teeth are forming. So they can tell by the molars that she was born somewhere in Southern Sweden or Norway, which has the kind of minerals that would have been in the water that she drank when she was a very small child. And then she moved West, maybe even as far as the British Isles when she was about eight. And she didn't get to Birka until she was older than 16. So this tells me where could she have traveled in, in the Viking world? Her weapons and the clothing in the grave also add to that story because some of these are connected with what was known as the Vikings East Way. So this was the trade route from Sweden to the East, through the Baltic, to Russia, down the Russian rivers to Constantinople, and also probably to Baghdad and connecting to the Silk Road. So her uh, her weapons um, are most often found along the East Way. And also this, this beautiful little silver cone that was positioned right on the top of the skeleton, top of the skull. So what has been part of her cap? Uh, there's an identical cap cone uh, mm -hmm. found in Kiev. So if you just look at the archeology, span we can say that this woman lived between 930 and 965. And she may have been born in Sweden or, or Southern Norway, moved to the British Isles, come to Birka, traveled all the way to Kiev, and then back to be buried in Birka. So then I started doing the historical research and looking at you know, medieval histories and sagas and poetries, looking for people who were alive in that window and that she might have known about or met or you know, whose stories she would have heard, people who were, you know, came before her. So that's when I started thinking about thinking like a historical novelist and, and had to give her a name so that I could you know, work out a plot 
that would allow her to meet some of these you know, historical people and to weave her story into these poems and sagas that you know, unaccountably left her out. You know, those poems and sagas, they give us a broader context of thinking about women. They do. And I'm left with the impression that you're coming at those very differently now than they've traditionally been here. Yes. Um, what, we, what we have thought about women in the Viking age really comes from the Victorian era. And it's, it's an 1800s, a 19th century way of thinking about what women can do and what women should do. Um, Viking studies and archeology span both started in the mid 1800s. And in fact, this concept of, of saying that graves with weapons were male, um, one of the researchers that I, whose work I read calls this sexing by metal. Um, but if there's, there's weapons in the grave, the grave is male. If there's jewelry in the grave, then the grave is female. That idea started in 1837. You know, before we had any statistics at all on, on Viking age graves, I mean, that was, that was way before the Viking ships were, were uncovered in the late 1800s. It was way before, you know, Birka was, uh, the 1100 uh, graves at Birka were, were dug up. So, I mean, so this was already- ideas about Vikings predate anything we actually know about Vikings? It predates the archeology. span Okay. Because when, um, these Victorian gentlemen, and of course they were gentlemen because uh, women were supposed to confine themselves to children, church, and kitchen. They were not to be you know, reading and writing books about Viking warriors, of course. Um, but when the Victorian gentlemen started reading the Icelandic sagas and translating the sagas and getting you know, interested in this culture, they saw the world of the Vikings through their, their own glasses, their own lenses. And so they saw the women who were the housewives, who had the keys on their belts and who were responsible for you know, clothing and food and, and you know, things like that. And the symbol of the Viking woman you know, became this, this housewife with keys, but there, there are really only very few examples in the text of housewives with keys, whereas there's lots and lots and lots of examples of women with weapons, but those were considered just mythology, you know, legends. We're not gonna take those seriously. We're going to focus in on the housewives. Right. So, for instance, when I first started studying uh, this, you know, Viking, Viking studies and the status of women in the Viking age, um, the scholars that I read um, were feminist, but they invested a lot of effort in proving how important an economic role it was to be a housewife. You know, and the idea was the men all went out raiding, so the women had to run the entire society. And this is a you know, a culture that exists in an environment where winter lasts 10 months. So you have to be really good at, at storing food and serving food or your people will starve. And it's a very cold environment. And so the women were generally in charge of the weaving and the, you know, the spinning. And so, you know, if you didn't have a cloak, you froze. They also made the sails. If you didn't have a sail, the Vikings went nowhere. So, you know, the, the economic importance of the housewife was was real i mean it was really important and i don't want to you know take anything away from the work that these these uh scholars have done on showing how important you know that work was and yet we sort of closed our eyes to the other options mm -hmm. all of these women who didn't stay at home who you know went places who uh fought in battles they're all just sort of written off as, you know, wish fulfillment or, or legends or, you know, supernatural. Whereas when you have men, male warriors doing really extreme athletic things and living to great ages and fighting dragons and turning into bears, those people are not considered legends and myths or not, not entirely, right. you know, they're just like, extreme male warriors they're not saying that well that's obviously unreal so men 
male warriors have to be legendary too. You know, you see what I'm, what I'm getting at. It's right. like, there's this, right. this, this double standard at work here that, you know, the women warriors are just ignored, but the male warriors who are doing the same crazy things are, well, they're just a little extreme. Yeah, because there's a so, the willingness to look at the male myth and find the germ of truth. Yeah, that, exactly. That not according to the... So was there a point at which you suddenly went, wait a minute, or did you kind of gradually slide into this awareness? Well, one of the things that was very influential is that I was reading the PhD dissertations of some young female archeologists who are doing really fabulous work right now. And for instance, there's one whose who's study, you know, I, I depended on a lot, Marianne Moen. She did a statistical study of all of the graves in a certain graveyard in Norway, looking for what's in the male graves and what's in the female graves. So if we get away from this idea of weapons versus jewelry, what exactly is in the graves? And she found that in the male graves, and these are, are graves that are known to be male from multiple perspectives, you know, from what the bones look like as well as what the objects are. She found in these male graves more often had pots and pans than female graves. So cooking equipment was a male grave attribute, not a female grave attribute. So what does that say about, you know, women being in the kitchen, being in charge of the food? It's like, maybe not. So, you know, we have, we have these ideas about, you know, what, were the gender roles of the time that do not have any scientific data or statistics backing them up. They are just assumptions, but they've been in the textbooks for 200 years. So they are very hard to get rid of. One of the things that, that I saw immediately and that I kept saying is like, why hadn't I noticed this before? Or why haven't people pointed this out before, was how women are portrayed in the Norse mythology. Now, this is something that I've studied quite a lot. Uh, my book, Song of the Vikings, is about you know, Snorri Sturluson, who is our best and, and maybe only source sometimes on, on Norse myths. And I got to know him very well when I wrote that book, which is a biography of him. And I realized that he is not trustworthy as a source. I mean, people use his definition of the Valkyries as being, you know, the standard definition of a Valkyrie. And he has them being these beautiful battle goddesses that ferry the dead heroes to Valhalla and serve them cups of mead. Well, if you look at Snorri's biography, if you look at him as a person, he was a misogynist. He was terrible to his wife and his lovers and his daughters. He was also a Christian. And he was living in a society that had been Christian for 200 years. And he was writing this book. He was collecting these myths as a, a book on hand, a handbook on poetry that he wanted to present to the 16 year old King of Norway who was under the control of bishops. So he put a Christian slant on these stories to get them past the bishops. <laughs> And he also just wrote down the stories that a young man would like, you know, because he was trying to impress this young, young king and, and get himself a good place at court. So he left out most of the stories of the goddesses. He left out about half of the mythology. He knew their names. He gives us their names, but he doesn't give us their stories. But there's this one glimpse that he does include that is the one that, that kind of, you know, opened my eyes. And that is the Norse creation myth. And you really have to read this in contrast to the Christian creation myth. Um, so in the Norse version, there's three gods wandering along the seashore and they find two logs of driftwood that have washed up and they decide we're gonna make these into humans. So they shape the wood into a male and a female and they bring them to life with blood, breath, and curious minds. Now, you compare this version of how people are made to the Christian version. In the Christian version, you have the man is made in the image of God, 
and the woman is made from his rib in order to be a helper and a support to him. So Eve is an afterthought. In the Norse version, the man Asker and the woman Embla are made at the same time, at, you know, from almost the same stuff by the same gods for the same purpose, which is essentially so they would worship the gods. Um, they are a team. And then the thing that, that was really neat was when you look at the trees, the driftwood that they're made from, the man is made from ash. And what is ash used for? It's used for spear shafts and oars, among other things. The woman is made from elm. And what is elm used for? It's used for wagon wheels and for hunting bows. So both the man and the woman have uses for killing and transportation. They have uses in peace and in war. And I think the same was very much true about the men and women of the Viking Age, that their roles were not decided by their gender, but by their individual characteristics. And the list that I, I like to use is their ambition, their ability, their family ties, and their wealth. So we've got Snuri's version of the Valkyries. Mm -hmm. Are there other versions of the Valkyries that appear either in sagas or in some other form as well? There are many of them. And the one that I think is most important is uh, Snorri's own nephew, uh, who wrote the Sturtlunga saga, which is the story or the saga of the events taking place during Snorri's own lifetime. Uh, this nephew describes Valkyries as being ugly troll women who smell bad and who drizzle uh, troughs of blood on the battlefield and whip men's heads off with bloody rags. So it's nothing at all like the beautiful goddesses that you, know, <laughs> that you want to meet on a battlefield. No, right. these, these ones you do not want to see on the battlefield. Um, and then there are many uh, warrior women who are called Valkyries, but who are every other way human, you know, who give good advice to the warriors and who, you know, complain about not wanting to get married and, and want to remain, you know, in the warrior band and dad, why are you forcing me to marry? And I won't marry anybody but somebody who's not afraid of anything. And, you know, they, they come across as real people, not as, as goddesses. And yet they were dismissed as totally legendary. So how do you get from there to your wonderful title, the real Valkyrie? How do I get to the real Valkyrie? Well, I just decided that uh, BJ581 was a Valkyrie. Mm -hmm. um, I decided to pretty much redefine the word um, <laughs> the way I wanted it to, what I wanted it to mean. And I took the idea of women with weapons. Mm -hmm. So for me, a Valkyrie is, is the largest category of women with weapons. And it includes the shield maids and it includes the goddesses and it includes the giants. Um, so if you just look at female characters in the texts who are women, and have weapons, you come up with a lot of names and, and stories. Mm -hmm. So those were the Valkyries that I was looking at. Um, if you think about the idea of classification, this is something that, that maybe is a, a modern idea that we, we put things in boxes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like species and the biologists are constantly trying to, you know, debate whether it's, you know, the Florida panther is a separate species from the California cougar, um, or are they the same species in just different ranges? So you have in botany, you have lumpers and splitters. Well, I'm a lumper. I lump all of the women with weapons together and I call them Valkyries because we really do not know what those words mean or what those words meant in the Viking times because Valkyrie and shield maid and you know, woman are used interchangeably in a lot of the poems and in a lot of the texts. And when we find these little images like the one that's on the cover of my book, you know, this, 
this beautiful little um, uh, amulet. It's only an inch tall and nobody knows. Were they supposed to be actual images of people? Were they supposed to be goddesses? Were they, were they religious icons? Were they, you know, something that just shows what, what army you're part of? Um, you know, we don't know what they are. They, they don't come with labels as, as the archeologist told me. So we have to, you know, come up with some other way to explain it. So one thing you do in your narrative for her, her book, mm -hmm. is you have her meet real historical women from the Bible, yes. um, three of them. Um, can you tell us about them and you know, who were they, whether they're considered legendary or not, how, how you weave her into their stories? Well, the, the approach that I took with this book, which makes it quite different than probably anything else I've, I've written, as well as anything else I've read, uh, is I begin each chapter with historical fiction. And then I step back and I explain my sources. And so in the historical fiction, uh, this skeleton comes to life and becomes Hervor, and she meets people who were at the same time and at the same place that she conceivably could have been. The first one that she meets is Gunhild, mother of kings. And Gunhild was the wife of King Eric Bloodaxe. She appears in 11 of the Icelandic sagas. She's always a villain. She also appears in all of the medieval histories of Norway. And in fact, one of them uh, defines the time in which she and her sons ruled Norway as the age of Gunhild. At the time that uh, Hervor was born and growing up to be you know, about five years old or eight years old, Gunhild and Eric Bloodaxe were trying to uh, become the uh, over king of Norway. Eric is the son of King Harold Fairhair who united Norway, but Harold then divided it up again among all of his sons. He had nine of them. And Eric and Goodhild systematically went through and tried to kill off all of Eric's half brothers. Um, at the time that well, they, they intersect with Herver's story because they um, take over Vestfold in the south of Norway, which is one of the possible places that she could have lived. And so I have her actually being captured um, in, in that event when um, there's, there's an archeological site called the Shining Hall that is burned down at about that time where she could have been and Gunhild and Eric also could have been. And so uh, Hervor is actually taken captive and because she is so courageous, she is raised with, uh, by Queen Gunhild as uh, one of her um, children. And that was also something that was quite common was that Queen Gunhild was known to raise the children of her enemies so that she could control them. Mm -hmm. um, they are exiled from Norway, um, conveniently, uh, at about the time that, that Hervor is known to have moved west. And so Hervor goes with Queen Gunhild and, and Eric to the Orkney Islands. And from there, they, they meddle in the politics of York in England. Eric becomes the King of York and in Dublin, Ireland. And, and this is all history. I mean, this is stuff that we know from both the Icelandic sources, the Norwegian histories, and also some of the English sources, though the chronology is not really well pinned down. Um, and we also have archeological uh, proof that you know, there was a King Eric in York and that there was uh, a great hall in, in Westfold that was burned down at the time. The second uh, actual person that she meets is a woman known as the Red Girl, who was the leader of a Viking fleet that was one of 16 Viking fleets that was attacking Munster in Ireland in the 10th century. And we know of her just in a list in uh, an Irish chronicle known as the War of the Irish with the Foreigners. Um, so she 
is a real person, but we don't have any stories about her as we do about Gunhild. Um, and it, but in my book, I have her ever meet her in Dublin and join her, her band. So that's a bit of uh, historical you know, fiction, a bit of speculation there that allows me to show what Dublin was like. You know, it was the largest slave market uh, in the Viking world at that time. And then the third person, the historical person she meets is Queen Olga of Kiev. And Olga is known from the Russian primary chronicle. And uh, she, like Queen Gunhild, is someone whose who's, uh, accomplishments have always been considered legendary or, or ascribed to her husband or to her son. Um, but according to the Russian primary chronicle, she not only avenged the death of her husband, but she destroyed a city. Um, which had, you know, the city that was responsible for his, his death. And archaeologists working at that site have just found out that, yes, it was burned down at about the time the Chronicle says she did it. Uh, she reigns over the Viking Rus in Kiev for about 10 years. And then her, her son takes over, Sviatoslav. And uh, there's this really great... Um, description of his last battle, which is sometimes called the Battle of the Danube in, in 971. There's a, a Byzantine history that describes this battle and says that the victorious army, which they call the Roman army, though we, we would call it Byzantine, found women lying among the fallen equipped like men, women who had fought against the Romans together with the men. Um, and that line has always been just sort of dismissed as, mm -hmm. oh, they must have been camp followers. <laughs> you know, it's just yeah. like, uh, <laughs> they're, they're really clearly identified as warriors, but no, we, we're not going to agree with that. Um, but this battle happened in 971. So uh, Herivor could not have been there. She was already buried in Birka by that time. But she does travel along the East Way in my book and meets Queen Olga and tells her about Queen Gunhild, the mother of kings. So this is how I, I kind of use this archeological study to, to wrap the entire Viking world from Dublin to Kiev into this one woman's um, lifespan. And, and the science says that's perfectly plausible um, that she could have gone to these places. And since she went to these places, I think it's plausible she could have met the people who were there. Yeah. So you do use this fictional style and it's very engaging and you've managed to make it absolutely clear which piece is historical fiction and which piece is well, it's all research based but which piece is not fiction um yeah do you have a fictional model that you drew on i'm sorry i know i'm throwing you a curve there uh i read a lot of historical fiction it, it's what i i enjoy most um but if you're thinking of like, who did I model my character on? Um, there are uh, women warriors in the sagas that, that definitely um, influenced, let's say, the character of, of Herivor that I created. Um, and the obvious ones are the two women named Herivor who are in the saga of Herivor uh, and in the poem known as Herver's Song. Mm -hmm. And Herver's Song is actually, is considered one of the oldest, um, or Herver's Saga, these two poems are considered the oldest uh, stories we have from the North. And both of them include strong women warriors. Uh, the first one, the first Herver in the saga uh, goes to her father's grave and opens it to get these, the uh, heirloom sword and there's this beautiful scene of, of her confronting the ghost of her father who doesn't want to give up the heirloom and, and how she has to bend him to her will. And in the, in the poem, one of the things that's, that's so amazing to me is that no one is surprised that the warrior is a woman. They're just surprised that she wants this sword because it is cursed. And, you know, nobody in their right mind would want a cursed sword, but she does. And the second character named Hervor from the same saga um, has two brothers who are fighting and she is given the command of the fortress on the border between her two brothers' lands. And so she is, you know, 
she's actually killed in the battle when the two brothers clash, but she is trying to defend this fortress and keep the, you know, keep the one brother from conquering. So uh, how much getting, earlier yeah. than Snurri are those two sagas? We don't really know. Um, it's very difficult to date the sagas, but this one in particular uh, probably was written in around 1120, so maybe 100 years before Snorri, because it has uh, a genealogy in it that leads up to a certain queen, and then it stops. And this queen was the queen of Sweden in, in around 1120. So it seems that there was maybe, it was maybe commissioned for her or somehow associated with her. So there's a possibility that it was 100 years before Snorri. But the, the stories that got written down in Sonori's time were a lot older than the versions we have. So we, we really have a hard time actually dating the stories. Mm -hmm. We're starting to come close to the end. And so we're probably gonna to wanna to leave some time for people to ask questions, but mm -hmm. is there one main idea you'd like readers to take away from this book? Well, I think the most important thing is to question our assumptions about what we know about the past and what we think we know about the past. Um, a lot of the things that I thought I knew were facts about women in the Viking age, I have had to rethink as I've been you know, doing this work. And I, I think um, that's probably true about our histories of many other times and places as you yourself know very well, <laughs> Pamela. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> we have to keep retelling the old stories because they're all told through a certain point of view. And you have to look back at what were the assumptions of the historians that came before you. And they may not be the assumptions you, you want to, to live by now. So do you have questions for us? So I'd like to say thank you so much to both of you, Nancy and Pamela. I think that was a really interesting um, discussion. And as an anthropology undergraduate student myself, I always love hearing exciting news in the world of archaeology mm -hmm. and how one discovery can really change the narrative of how we think yeah. about our past. So I always find it so exciting. Um, before I get to some questions, there are a couple moments if anyone wants to submit a question. I want to write, I know it's Soon, you just released this book. What is your next topic on Viking history you want to tackle? Because you've written so many books. I'm assuming you've already got something else in the pipeline you want to do. Well, I actually do not. Um, what I'm thinking I might want to do is to write more historical fiction. So I'm, I'm right now looking to make a bit of a genre change. It was, it was so much fun writing the historical fiction parts of this book that I, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I actually want to go back and, and do some more of that. And uh, it will definitely be um, saga related, but I'm thinking more about the 1200s, you know, when Snorri and his, his family were active than, than earlier, earlier times. Well, I'm sure all your previous research and other previously published books will really come in handy with writing those even though Absolutely. it's a genre jump. Yeah. So, okay, we do have a couple questions in. Um, Corinne has a question. She's, first of all, she wanted to say, really interesting, thank you. Many of my ancestors were Vikings and it's wonderful to hear about their women warriors. You mentioned that you read a great deal of historical fiction. Could you please recommend some authors you like? And are there any authors writing about Viking women in particular? Well, I had a, a chat just last week with Linnea Hartsecker, who has written a trilogy based on the uh, saga of King Harold Fairhair, and I would, I would highly recommend that. Uh, the first book in the saga is The Half-Drowned King, and there is a character named Svanhild who, who becomes uh, quite important uh, as, the, as the story uh, goes on, but she would, she would be the one that I would recommend right away. Sounds like a great recommendation. And plus we'll probably be able to tune into your books in some point too. Um, we have another question regarding the PBS program about the Burke grave. Um, I'm not sure, I'm assuming you probably watched it. Um, the Secrets of the Dead. What are your thoughts on it? And did it tell the story accurately? It's a long time since I watched that. So I, I can't really say too much about it but I think it was fairly accurate. Um, yeah, it's, it's been a while since I, I saw that version. But if they, um, I believe they interviewed 
Charlotta Head and Sterna Jonsson, who is the same person that I interviewed. So it should be, it should be pretty good. Great. Mm -hmm. um, Mary wants to know if you've been to, to the UNESCO Viking site in Newfoundland. Um, she believes there was a woman hero there. So she wants to know if you've yes. been there. Absolutely. That, um, that woman is the focus of my book, The Far Traveler, which came out in, in 2007. Uh, her name is uh, Gudrider, or Gudrid the Far Traveler. And she went, uh, she was born in Iceland, married in Greenland, and then traveled from Greenland to North America and stayed for about three years. And we believe that she was um, actually one of the people at Lansome Meadows in Newfoundland. So if you want to learn more about, about her, you can read that book of mine. Oh, that's really fantastic. Um, I just want to thank both of you so much, seriously. And Pamela, thank you so much for moderating tonight's discussion. I want to give you the chance too, because you wrote a book about uh, warrior women. Um, what else are you researching? Are you writing anything? Do you have any projects in the pipeline yourself? I do have a project in the pipeline. I am working on the biography of a woman named Sigrid Schultz. Um, she was the first woman to be a bureau, foreign bureau chief for a major American newspaper. But you know, just being first is not enough to be a story. But she worked for the Chicago Tribune in Berlin, 1919 to 1941. So mm -hmm. she was in the face of Nazis pretty regularly. She was afraid for her life frequently. And she didn't pull her punches about what she reported. And she found some very creative ways to get the news out. And I'm nowhere near, I'm just beginning writing at this point. I'm deep in the research phase, but I'm very excited about it. I am sure that's gonna be a fascinating story. I know everything with World War II has quite an audience right now. So I can't wait to hear more about it as more details emerge. So as we're coming to our close tonight, um, I just want to again thank, say thank you so much, both Nancy and Pamela. Don't forget the real Valkyrie right here is available in hardback, um, a courtesy of our own local independent bookstore, The Learned Owl. We did put the link in the purchase or you can visit their website. Um, so again, thank you so much to everybody um, and please take care. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.